Actually, this film was the first film that I worked with a DP because the handful of other short films that I had made, I shot myself. Like, I was convinced that it was not possible. Mm -hmm. But there was, like Jarvis and I agreed, there was a 5% chance. And for me, it, that was enough to at least continue to try because there was no, there was actually no risk in continuing to move forward mm -hmm. um, other than time wasted. Thank you for tuning in to the Tilly Shorts Roll to Feature podcast. Tonight we have Alan Kim. He is a writer, director, and producer. And we are lucky to be able to pick his brain. And my name is Shay. Hi guys, I'm Prinda. Alan. <laughs> um, so we do have a couple of questions for you tonight. And our first question is, what inspired you to get into the film industry? Yeah, um, I'm not sure that I would consider myself to be a part of the film industry officially, but um, yeah, I started out uh, when I was younger just editing family vacation videos on iMovie and I got into narrative work when I was 18. So when I was in high school, last year of high school, decided to make my first short film. So that was a lot of uh, watching videos online, like how to light, how to use a microphone, all that kind of stuff. And then, um, yeah, so wrote, wrote a screenplay for that and then directed that and then edited. Um, that took about eight months to make. It was like just over 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, the idea was just to make it and then say, okay, I've made a film before and then just mm -hmm. done, move on. So uh, right after I made that, that was just, um, just before I started college. So I grew up in Ohio, by the way, so. Made that in Ohio and then flew over to California. So started school and uh, I was studying economics. And after about a year in, uh, I was just getting bored. And so I was like looking around for if there were any other film production clubs on campus. And so I, I quickly realized that there were actually no, uh, no film clubs making films on mm -hmm. campus. And so I was like um, dabbled around here and there and then decided to, to start a film club because I thought that that was something that would benefit the school and also was lacking at the time. So, so Cap Club was founded in 2018 and um, just been making films through that. So that's kind of how I got into film. Wow. No sé. ¿Qué no ya te había dicho que era suficiente para hacer escribir? Que tienes un trabajo de verdad, papi. No te distraigas. All my friends tell me how talented you are, hon, with your artwork and your sketches and, and your colors. Going for art, for God's sake. Okay, it's art. You ever think it's a good thing? You didn't have parents growing up? You could just do your own thing, you know? I don't know. That's okay, you don't have to say anything. Are you really a real person? I don't know if you're a real person. 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 Like, what are the steps to even create a film club at UC Berkeley? Sure. I mean, it was uh, just followed the basic steps of creating a student club. Uh -huh. um, the the value proposition that I had at the time was that there were no other film clubs that were um, that were committed and focused just on production. Uh -huh. There were some film clubs here and there that were um, doing production and doing classes at the same time, but 
um, because they were kind of diluted in doing the classes as well, um, they weren't actually producing that many films. And so mm. that was the value proposition that we had. And so just went through the school mm. as a registered student organization, still is today. Yeah. And um, started that. And uh, yeah, over the years, we've just kind of, kind of grown and continued to make films. So if I was a member of this club, what can I expect out of it? Yeah, so members join, and it's changed, it's changed a lot over the years. So in the beginning, it was very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have four, they call it signatories, so mm -hmm. four like founding members. Uh -huh. But at the time, I didn't know anyone else who was interested in film, and so I had to convince some of my dorm roommates mm -hmm. <laughs> to sign on, yeah. um, just so we could pass the, get the paperwork in submitted. But um, in the beginning, it was very small, and, and the problem uh, early on was recruiting. And if you're going to start a film club, it's very difficult. Turns out it's very difficult to recruit if you don't have a portfolio, oh. if you haven't made a film. And so um, it was just uh, trying, to, trying to sell the club and sell the vision to folks just out on, on campus. And eventually we got a small handful of people and eventually we made our first short film. Mm -hmm. And then gradually as our portfolio expanded, I mean kind of simultaneously, our member count expanded. And then of course along with that, the a production value gradually increased. You're starting to get more original, unique stories. Um, so we just kind of continued to grow uh, that way. As a member now, you can expect to join and uh, new members will, I believe they make, I'm not a part of operations anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of an advisor. Mm -hmm. But um, you're, as a member, you'll be making two films, two short films per semester. Oh. So over the course of four months, you're basically making two films. Um, and so you're kind of uh, grouped into different, different different team members and the operating the the board right now. They'll basically categorize people based on their strengths and their weaknesses, and they'll kind of formulate a cohesive team, diverse team, and then they'll go off and they'll make a short film from, from scratch. So um, you actually brought up two points um, that um, I would like to ask about. One, um, when it came to building your portfolio. Did you all find any um, any deterrence on the road um, when dealing when dealing with criticism or constructive uh, or feedback that wasn't so constructive? Like, how did you handle that? If it was that, I mean, I, like at the end of the day, there there wasn't a group of people or or like a like a panel or anything that was judging our films. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of, in the beginning, it was just a matter of building community. And so, um, in the beginning, we just kind of split off into groups and we brainstorm. And the idea was to uh, create the most original story that you possibly could just think of. And so, nothing that, no, no like, uh, nothing typical that you'd find. And we also wanted to avoid major technical problems, either on, on set or also in the edit, that make it obvious that it is a student film. Mm. And so, um, yeah, in the beginning, um, we were just trying to make as many films as possible. And in fact, actually, during COVID was, I think, one of our, our big milestones. That period of COVID was when we actually grew the most as a club. And uh, one reason was because we decided at the time to uh, continue to make films, even when people were remote. Mm -hmm. And so people figured out all sorts of ways to make films, um, shoot it, like one person would shoot it wherever they were, mm -hmm. then another person would edit it, another person would write it. They kind of um, flexed everything that we had in order to just continue to make films. And that benefited us because all the other film clubs, unfortunately, stopped making films during COVID. And so uh, what, that, what ended up happening was once COVID was over, we ended up being kind of the only film club standing on campus, which allowed us to um, attract a lot of new members okay. after COVID. And so uh, what you end up seeing is that that kind of growth became exponential as we kind of rolled off of COVID. So more and more people joined because we were the only film club that was actually continuing to make films. And then, um, of course, now that COVID's over, people are kind of in person and in groups making films. So in building a team back then, I understand that um, originally you had asked the four, um, start, you know, the people to, to build the first four um, founding members. But when it came to finding more people, was it still heavily on just recruiting for um, 
you know, members and support? Or did you have time to start looking for people that had specific um, resources, skills, time availability? Like what was the biggest, well, that's the second question. What was the biggest um, priority during that time when looking for new members? Yeah. Um, it, well, the, the three other founding members uh, were not involved in the club. They were just my friends who would sign the papers. Um, so in, in the beginning, it was just me kind of on, out on campus trying to convince people to join the club. And the first question that they would ask is, or they would ask two questions. One is, how many members are there? And two, um, where can I see your films? Oh. <laughs> and the answer was zero. And we have made zero films. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, the priority at that time was just to basically reiterate the purpose of, of the club and recruit people, um, basically anyone who would show an interest and anyone who would be committed. Oh, yeah. So commitment was a big one. And even, at, even once we kind of started to, to produce films, I think commitment was the number one thing that we would recruit for. And I would argue that even still today because... Um, just from experience and seeing how the teams kind of team together and their ways of working, um, more often than not, it's the commitment of each team member on a like on each project mm -hmm. group that um, kind of is is the most important. Over it, it actually trumps um, like skill or expertise most of the time because you'd rather have someone who's highly committed to a project who maybe not uh, may not have as many skills but are willing to learn and actually put in the work versus someone who's highly skilled and not be committed to the project. So um, for, for f future aspiring um, creatives, when it comes to having that type of dedication, what is words of motivation that you can give them to make sure that they stay on track and not give up or lose sight when they don't have enough support in the beginning? Um, I mean, I, I suppose it depends on kind of what phase of your filmmaking journey you're on. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I think um, at least what I personally kind of think back to is filmmaking is, I, I think, very unique in the sense that I would argue that it's the best way to tell a story. I mean, there are many different ways to tell a story, but Filmmaking is unique in that, like, rather than a book, like you read it and you're just kind of um, you're experiencing you're experiencing a, a story through text. Um, in, in film, you can tell a story through not only the writing and the dialogue, but also through the the visuals and also through the music. The music yeah. has its own storytelling, as well as kind of the pacing of the edit. So there are many different ways that you can move a story forward, and so. Um, and you know nowadays anyone can can make a film, and so I think if you have a story that you're really tied to or really passionate about, then um, there's nothing that's stopping you from from making it and telling a story. And I think it's worthwhile for you to make the story and tell the story because someone out there is going to watch it, and someone's going to be you know, like the purpose of your story is to get people to think and feel, right? So I think just the the potential and the possibility of of moving an audience, I think that's plenty of incentive to make films. True. Mm. What makes or breaks a film for you? Like there's so much detail that goes into it, like, like you said, the music, the characters, the dialogue, but what, what does this film need to have for sure for, you know, for it to be successful, for people want to enjoy it, watch it and everything? Yeah, so I think it's kind of twofold. One, Particularly around student films, mm -hmm. I would say it's really um, it's really easy to point out if something is made by students. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things is from a technical standpoint, mm -hmm. because when you go to the theaters and you watch a Hollywood movie, if a film is deemed not great, it's almost always because of the story. Usually, there's something going on with with the writing or the acting, but it's almost never. Yeah, no one's gonna say this film had terrible production sound, and so it's terrible. Like that doesn't happen because mm -hmm. the standard is perfection when it comes to technical stuff. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. your sound has to be spot on, your editing has to be spot on. It's like invisible; you can't notice it. It can't be distracting. And I think with student films, 
a lot of the times, I mean, even with student films that have great story, great writing, the execution falls short, and a lot of the times from you know lack of experience or lack of budget and resources. Mm -hmm. But um, those are some of the telltale signs of a student film. So I think when I'm watching student films, films that are able to, or like really indie, like no budget films, I think the films that where my attention is solely on the story, I think that's impressive in and of itself because that means that there's nothing technical, there, there are no technical flaws that are distracting me away from the story, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the first part. And then I think um, when it comes to the Hollywood films, um, it, it's like, I think the most important thing is obviously story. I think mm -hmm. it's story for both, but even more so on, on Hollywood films. Um, and I, know, I just believe that for, with all the films that I really admire and I remember, there are mm -hmm. always, there's always like that one moment or a set of moments in a film that you, remem you remember. So I think this goes down to the writing process. Um, whether it's, it's writing or even, I think writing, directing, or even editing, to find those moments that kind of give the audience chills. I think if a film is able to execute on those moments really well, that mm -hmm. makes a great film, I'd say. So, oh, thank you for the answer. Um, so I did want to ask um, about your background. Um, when it came to you writing and directing your first uh, feature film, you had mentioned earlier that um, you were working and consulting. Did you find any um, benefits to having that professional background when it came to making movies or was there any type of drawbacks as far as like scheduling, prioritizing self-care, spending time with friends and family, things like that? Yeah, uh, prioritizing self-care, there was, there was none of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think there were any synergies between my full-time job and, and working on the film. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually kind of a nice separation, I would say. Um, but it's always been the case, it's kind of interesting because it's always been the case that um, part of me would, uh, there's a, it's always, I'm a kind, of, kind of always at a fork in the road where, um, and you know, often the conclusion is let go of the film and just focus on you know, everything else I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And then in some way, shape or form, and this happens constantly over the years, it just film tends to kind of seep back in. And so that's kind of what happened with, with Land's End. Uh, the feature film. Um, started writing it in December mm -hmm. of 2022. Um, but when I had graduated in 2021, I thought, uh, I knew that I'd be coming back for, for, for grad school. And so I knew that I had two years to, to potentially make a feature film. I thought it'd be, it'd be cool. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the idea was like, I have two years to do it. We'll see what happens. And then, so, you know, whenever I have time, I would kind of write some story ideas, brainstorm, um, start writing some screenplays, and then figure out that it's not worth all the effort for this story. This story just oh. doesn't warrant that amount of effort. So I just toss and toss. And then eventually in December, came up with an interesting kind of narrative structure, which is now Land's End, and started to write. And so the writing process was literally, I mean, I was working from like 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. and then grab a bite and then just write for a few hours, go to sleep. It was basically like that for, for a while. Um, and then, but of course, at, while writing this, I knew that this was, like at the time I was very certain that it was not gonna be made. Oh, wow. Uh, because given the timeline, I wanted to finish the film before I started school, because I knew that there was no way for me to do both. Mm -hmm. And I knew that at this pace, I would finish the script and um, you know, also the people who would work on, as the, as the crew members, uh, they were in school, and so I'd have to wait until they're on summer break, which meant that was gonna be when we shot the film. Mm -hmm. So that was two months of shooting. I kind of knew while writing. And if we can finish by late July, we'd have to just edit super fast to get it done before I started grad school. And I knew that that, that timeline was pretty much impossible. Oh. So I tried to, but at the same time, while writing, I tried not to constrain the story uh, because of those constraints, which kind of goes against all advice that people say. Mm -hmm. People always say, like, given your resources and your budget and your timeline, you know, that informs kind of the constraints of the story. I tried not to do that. Mm -hmm. So 
wrote the story. Initially, it was 120 pages. And then the first person I talked to was Jarvis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I knew that the nature of the story, so one of the ideas of the film is that there are three characters and three human characters. And the fourth character is this location, is this forest mm -hmm. called Land. This forest is Land's End in San Francisco, if you've ever been to there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I knew that that, given the nature of the story, the music was extremely important. Mm -hmm. So the music was actually going to be play a huge part in driving the story. And the only composer I knew at the time was Jarvis. <laughs> oh. So I talked to Jarvis, talked for a while, and he was like, okay, cool. You know, let me know when the script is done. So, and this was back in February. This is while I was kind of in the middle of writing. And eventually, you know, finished the, the script. And we went through, you know, all the motions of pre-production and everything. And then once we started production, I was still working. Mm -hmm. And I knew that a lot of uh, the crew members were also working. So they were working part-time jobs or doing internships or taking classes during mm -hmm. the weekdays. So we knew that we'd be shooting on the weekends. So calculated how many days we have available and then also divided like the page count with the number of days we had. So we oh, knew wow. that we had to shoot a certain number of minutes of runtime mm -hmm. per day. And it was very high. Oh, wow. So um, yeah, just kept going, went through production. And um, eventually it got to a point, I would say in July, it got to a point where it was uh, conflicting very heavily with my job. Mm. So because it ended up being that um, I had to spend a lot more time during the weekdays to prepare for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, that became very difficult working full time, and I was I was gonna quit at the same time oh. pretty soon because I was starting school. Mm -hmm. But I ended up quitting um, about two weeks earlier just to make things easier. So, yeah, that was kind of the relationship. But that was kind of how we went through um, the making of the film and kind of the relationship between my job and <laughs> making the film. Well, was there any um, unforgettable moments that you had? shooting Land's End. Was there any, like, any scenes that like, you'll never forget about? All of it is forgettable because we were all <laughs> sleep deprived. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, everything is, was very memorable, I would say. Uh -huh. It was very, I mean, to me, it's a very fruitful memory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot, large part of it was bonding through the pain, I would say, our crew. Um, I mean, we were a very young crew. Mm -hmm. I think average age is like 21. So uh, most of us were students. And yeah, I think the, well, there's one thing that I, I will never forget, mm -hmm. which is there's a scene in the film that was one of the first images that I had visualized, um, that I was able to clearly visualize while writing. Because most of the time um, I, I visualize the film kind of after I've written and I've let it marinate for a while, but this was this one was something that I kind of had as I was writing, mm -hmm. which was this kind of sil sunset backdrop, like silhouetted dance scene. Mm -hmm. And um, this involved kind of choreography as well. And I had actually written the song um, around the time that I, I wrote the scene. Mm -hmm. So I knew what it would sound like. And I also tend to do this where I write to music, which is kind of probably atypical. But yeah. this scene I wrote, and then I also wrote the music for the scene kind of around the time. So I kind of knew exactly uh, what, what it would look like in the final scene. Um, and this is pretty typical, I would say, but I, don't, I think the success rate of it actually looking like how you envisioned it is pretty low, I would say. But you, I think most filmmakers tend to do this. Um, so that night, when we were shooting this, uh, we were kind of... Um, scampering around trying to figure out how to choreograph this thing. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to, to choreograph because we were running out of time, like the sun was setting. Mm -hmm. But then Jarvis kind of came in, the, Jarvis who's the producer, choreographer, composer, and a lot of other things. Uh -huh. But um, he kind of came in because he, he comes from a ballet background, I believe. So he kind of knew how to teach dance. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to explain to him what it should look like. Oh. And then he would kind of translate it into dance language to the actors. Right. So it was just them rehearsing for, I think, an hour and a half or so. And eventually, we are out in the middle of nowhere in Vacaville, California. And the sun is setting. And so we shoot some of the kind of running scenes. And we wanted to shoot the, 
actually like the silhouetted scene, which only lasts for like seven or eight seconds, by mm -hmm. the way, in the film. We wanted to shoot that scene when the sun was just dipping below the horizon. Okay. So you don't see any major kind of streaks of light. It was just as it has fully set below the horizon. So it's just this beautiful kind of purplish orangey color. So uh, we shoot everything, we wait, we get our dolly set up and everything, and we start going for takes. And I believe we did seven takes and we used the last one. But once we finished that take and then we finished another dialogue scene kind of during blue hour, uh, it was completely dark. And I remember watching the footage off of the monitor, like playing it back. And it was exactly how I had envisioned the, oh, the scene. Oh, wow. Like when I was writing it. And we also, this is interesting because normally, um, normally you score to picture. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we actually shot to score. Because we, we actually had this, the soundtrack ready for that scene. So it was already made. So it was kind of like we were shooting a musical in a way. Oh, wow. Um, so they were dancing to the tempo of the song. And um, when they were rehearsing, they were dancing to the, the track that we had already made. Um, and so once we were actually going for the take, it was still just Jarvis clapping to the tempo. I actually had his, he had his metronome on his, on his phone, so he was clapping, oh, wow. keeping track, oh. make sure they were dancing to specific parts of the song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And eventually we got it, and so I was watching the, the scene, uh, just, just the clip, and I played the song, and it matched perfectly, and it was, it was amazing. So after getting that, I remember uh, my DP, Steven, and I were so on a, like, we were just on a high from getting that <laughs> shot. Because it was literally exactly how we had imagined it, and he had his um, he had his like gimbal arm. He had this whole like steady cam on him, and we were just like, "Do you want to race?" And so we just sprinted <laughs> down the road because we were so excited to get the shot. So we were just sprinting for like a minute wow. in the middle of the night back to the car <laughs> after getting that shot. That is super interesting. Now I wonder if it hadn't been that way, if it was the other way around, like if you were to shoot the scene first before the music got there. Would, it had definitely been different, right? Mm, but yep, because yeah. of the time constraint that you had, like I'm so impressed that that worked out the way it did. Yeah, did yeah. The, I'm sorry, did the actors um, have any dancing experience prior to this? I think the girl did, right? The, the girl had dancing experience, um, but she didn't, I don't think she had Walt's dan Walt style uh, dancing oh, experience. Okay. But mm -hmm. she knew how to move and dance. And follow because, direction. Yeah. Uh, so she was definitely helping our, our lead, Fernando, along with kind of the, the movements and kind of how to create flow in the way that they were dancing. But I mean, to your point, if we would have, it w actually would not have been possible to shoot that without some kind of um, song or oh, yeah. uh, before, before knowing the tempo at least, mm -hmm. because um, then we wouldn't know kind of what pace to dance at. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. So moving forward, if you were to do another um, musical style scene. Would you do like the sound, like shooting the picture to the soundtrack again? Yeah, we would have to do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when it comes to your directing style, how would you describe your approach to doing scenes or the whole movie overall? Yeah. Um, I mean, I have no idea. I, I don't really know if I'm doing my. Uh, like I, I've never seen another, like I've never been trained as a director mm -hmm. and I've also never watched another person direct, like another professional director, she'd be on set. So I'm not really sure <laughs> what to oh. do on set other than just, I wouldn't really consider myself any of the, I would just consider myself to be like just a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, so anything necessary to get the film made and get the story told, that's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So um, on set, I mean, I, I really don't know what type of director I am. I think probably my crew members would be able to answer that better, but mm -hmm. um, I'm very used to, just from having a kind of run and gun style short film making background. Mm -hmm. um, actually, this film was the first film that I worked with a DP because the handful of other short films that I had made, I shot myself. And I was actually originally intending to DP this film, just shoot it by myself because that's what I was used to. But eventually I was convinced otherwise and you know, eventually I ended up partnering with Steven. But um, yeah, it's always been kind of very fast, um, very lean, no fat, like no wasted time, everyone's moving. 
So everything's just been, been very quick. And I think one of the things that I, I learned from, from this film is that you know, things are always chaotic on set, but it's important to try your best not to show the, let the impatience um, kind of made evident t toward the actors especially. Oh, yeah. um, that's quite important. I mean, it's, it's fine to, I think it's okay to not necessarily be impatient, but um, not create a sense of urgency with crew. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to cast, it's best to avoid doing that outside. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a question about, um, well, um, I don't know the right way to say it. So. When you finally finish your your um, projects, when you get to the part where it's time for editing and you start to notice like, hey, we could have did this better, do you feel like just go run with it or do you feel more critical and wanting to like reshoot those scenes? Hmm, yeah. Um, I tend not to reshoot, mm -hmm. I would say. Just kind of move on. I mean, because I started out editing, um, most of the time, I, I kind of find a way to make things work in the edit. Um, but yeah, I, we did, I think we did two reshoots for Land's End. Mm. And it wasn't even a reshoot, it was more of a go back to get more coverage. So yeah, I think, and it, it, was, it was also hard because we didn't have that much time. Oh. And um, you know everyone's busy. People have their schedules. You know, so it's not like we had a budget allocated for reshoots. Mm -hmm. So we um, just kind of moved on. Yeah. And also, once you bring up the word budget, I did have a question about that. So, seeing that you all are still students, you're most likely not working on a big budget. Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to that, how much grace do you give yourself when? you have um, like areas where there could have been, um, things could have been planned better or um, maybe the actors could have rehearsed it, rehearsed more if you could have been able to get this studio or anything like that. Like how do you work with the budgets that you all might be working with and also taking in account that there may be, you know, error? Yeah. Um. So we had a very small budget. Mm -hmm. um, it's the money that I had saved from working. Oh. Um, and, but it never, yeah, so, so the standard, the expectation, what I told everyone was, after we make this film, and if we were to screen it at a theater, and a random stranger were to walk in, sit down and watch this movie, there should be no obvious indicators that it's made by students. And I knew that it was possible because we were shooting on a decent camera, we were shooting with a decent microphone, and Jarvis had labs. <laughs> so we knew that we'd get clear audio, that's for sure. And if we didn't, it wouldn't be because of budget. Mm -hmm. It'd be because we didn't, we just messed up as people, as, as the crew. So that was the expectation going in. And so um, the way that we lit the scenes, the way that we captured sound, um, everything was uh, done with the kind of mindset that it should meet that standard of there should be no, no distractions mm -hmm. so that everyone can just focus on the story. So, so most of the budget honestly went toward transportation, props, some of the gear that we rented, as well as food. <laughs> that was pretty funny. much, and, and also everyone worked on a, everyone, I mean, it also helped that everyone volunteered so nobody was paid. Mm -hmm. This was completely no budget. People were volunteers. Mm -hmm. They wanted to do it uh, either for fun or they had time or they wanted to, you know, learn from it. And so, yeah, that's how we that's how we rolled. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing that you are a writer and director, is there any genre that um, you see as a challenge and you want to tackle? Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. I I don't even. I, I don't know if, I don't know that I tend to lean toward a specific genre because I've dabbled in kind of a wide range of genres. 
but I think one genre that I think I'd be interested in exploring is kind of a thriller with a really well-written villain. Mm. Um, I haven't. I don't think I've done that before. I think that'd be quite interesting to play around with. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, aside from what you've already done on set, is there anything else that's different that you'd want to pursue too? So like maybe you'd want to try, um, I don't know, not directing, not producing. Would you ever want to be in front of the camera as an actor as well? I don't think I'd make a good actor. <laughs> no. um, How did you find your actors for your previous projects? Like, did you ha um, have somebody help be a casting agent for it or did you um, have anybody in mind already or did you completely hold auditions or how did that work? Yeah, um, I mean for the short films it was a lot easier because mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it was literally do you know anyone who could play this character? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> asking right. around and like people know other people uh -huh. so it was a bit easier that way but for Land's End, I mean we were dealing with 48 actors yeah. that we needed to cast. Mm -hmm. Three leads, a lot of secondary characters. Um, so I was very stressed about that. that mm -hmm. I think, so, you know, going into this, um, we knew that we had a very, very low probability of success. Um, even going into production, we knew that we'd probably not finish production because, I mean, if somebody doesn't show up on set mm -hmm. or if an actor doesn't, like that's, we're missing one day. And if we miss one day, we're gonna, nothing's gonna work out because our schedule was completely packed. Like everything had to line up. So, um, oh, sorry, what was the question? I forget. Um, what was the casting process? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so casting I was very concerned about. Um, the script was finished in April, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and we started casting, we went basically mid-April until late May. And I think around, that, around late May, we had casted about 70% of our cast. We actually casted through production. Mm -hmm. So we were shooting, and then over the weekdays, we would cast. And then we would shoot. So we kind of had to swap some scenes around based on who we had casted. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, we were just putting out casting calls on backstage, casting networks, all that kind of stuff. And then held auditions. Mm -hmm. Held auditions for two weekends mm -hmm. in, I think, May. And, yeah, found our cast. Oh. Um, when you look back at your first project, to what you've worked on most currently. Have you noticed any progress in uh, maybe something that you thought you wasn't gonna be good at? Yeah, so I've always considered myself pretty bad at writing dialogue. Um, and when I look back at watch kind of the short films, I would say, I would say production value is decent for mm -hmm. a student film, but some of the writing and some of the, the story just is like, mediocre mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the I did a kind of a self-analysis after I graduated and kind of looked at all the films that I had made and what would be interesting to do next and one of the things that I really wanted to explore was a lot of really emotional dialogue and um, you know if you watch Land's End there's a lot of emotional dialogue in mm -hmm. there so kind of while I was writing I was trying to figure out kind of really fast-paced and also explore the emotion of anger as well, a lot in the film. And so kind of anger being portrayed through dialogue and other ways, other methods. So yeah, I think over time, and I think honestly just for this film, mm -hmm. um, the dialogue has become kind of a more major role in the, in the film. And it also carries more emotion. So actually, the comment I just made about me being an elder to you but can learn from you, how do you approach advice from mentors or from people that you might be older than? Like, do you know when um, it's good advice or when to discern yeah. right or wrong? Yeah. Um, I think particularly around, particularly around this film, there was a lot of feedback, I think, that I asked for from 
everyone was pretty much younger, younger than me. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's not like age or anything that matters. It's mm. like we're all trying to achieve the same thing, which is to tell um, a story to the best of our abilities. And so, I mean, while I was writing the script, I was constantly asking for feedback. Mm. Um, and a lot of the times, people would be like, "Oh, you know, it's it's good," and I'd say, "Okay, like, just don't tell me just only the bad things. That's <laughs> oh. that's that's what will actually like make a difference." Um, so I tried to minimize like the validation or the and the acknowledgments and just ask for all the bad things about the story. Um, and a lot of people were hesitant, but there were some people who were very open and willing to share critical feedback, and so. That was very helpful, um, and just to keep a keep you know stay very objective, not to take things personally, but just actually hear what people have to say, and then also even you know going through production, you know, like when I was going through production, that was my first time being on set in over two years. I had not been involved in filmmaking mm. for quite some time, and so when I was back on set, I knew that even for me personally, I had to kind of get back into the rhythm of things and find my stride. And so, you know, throughout I was asking crew members, particularly Jarvis, like, what do you think about how I am on set? You know, what could I be doing differently? What am I kind of screwing up on? And so, you know, he would say, you know, generally like, it's okay. I would kind of push him to tell me like all the bad things. And so he told me a couple things that I thought were, were useful. I learned a lot from the actors as well. Asked them, you know, cause they have more experience you know, working on sets, like they've been directed by different types of people. And so mm -hmm. I ask, you know, on the other projects that you're a part of, what sort of directing style or notes are helpful for you as an actor? And so I learn a lot from them as well. So, yeah, I think having a, kind of having a negative feedback loop is, is important. Um, so when it comes to creating the characters for your um, movies, how much of your personal experience or lifestyle do you incorporate into building the characters? Yeah, I, so for this film, I don't think I consciously try to um, make the characters kind of trace back to my personal experience. Um, I think subconsciously and it ended up being that case <laughs> while writing the characters, but there was nothing that was super intentional about trying to make these characters reflect my own life or anything like that. I was just trying to write the most interesting characters possible. And, you know, initially, it actually, initially the story was supposed to take place at a diner. Oh, wow. It was the idea of staying in one location the whole time, but seeing different characters come through and interact. Maybe a couple comes in and they interact. Maybe like some coworkers come in and you meet different characters, but it's told in a nonlinear way. So you kind of jump back, you jump forward, and eventually you tell an interesting story that way. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought it might be kind of visually boring or tiring to just be in a diner the whole time. So expanded that idea of one location to a forest, mm -hmm. which is Land's End. Um, and in the earlier versions of the script, there was more of the forest that was carried through the entire film. But now we ended up making kind of the forest occupy most of the third act and everything before is kind of what leads each character to this forest. Yeah. Um, so I think while writing that, so you know, after coming up with that structure, um, I thought it'd be interesting to tell a uh, story through three characters just because I like the number three. Yeah. And you know, the HBO role, which is like every 15 minutes you Kind of, there's a change in, uh, in the plot. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of jump between the three characters every 15 minutes and tell a story that way. Um, and and I, you know, I thought, okay, it'd be three characters and the nature of the story is that these c three characters um, don't know each other in the beginning. And they come from very different backgrounds. They come from different countries, different locations. Mm -hmm. So the idea was um, maybe it'd be interesting to tell the story in three different languages. And so the only three languages I knew and I currently know, which is English, Korean, and Spanish. Oh, wow. So initially wrote the script in English mm -hmm. and then had the help of um, a few colleagues, crew members, and also members who were fluent in each language to help me with some of the bulk translation and some of the fine tuning when it came to slang and that kind of stuff. So 
that's kind of how it evolved. And I think as a result of like the nature of these characters' conflicts is a lot of the tension lies with the family. So I tried to um, come up with sort of difficult or tough situations that mm -hmm. I think would be relatable to people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the aspiration was even based on culture as well. But something that people could uh, relate to. And maybe uh, some of that writing came from my personal background. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there was nothing really conscious. Like I didn't consciously try to personalize, like try to, try to make these characters relate to me. Mm -hmm. Try to just make them interesting and go through challenging situations and also go through kind of gratifying moments as well. Yeah. Thank you. Where do you see yourself in filmmaking in the next five to ten years? I mean, I would love to continue to make films. Um, I think it's one of the only things, if not the only thing, that where, you know, when I'm involved in a project, it's, you know, you wake up and that's the first thing you think about. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I don't think I've had that kind of um, visceral of a kind of reaction with work uh, in any other field. You know, so, I mean, particularly for Land's End, it was basically from December until September. Mm -hmm. For nine yeah. months, you're just waking up every morning thinking about the film. So every single day, you're just thinking about it. And it, and it was like one of two feelings when mm -hmm. I woke up. It was, the world is ending, this is never gonna happen, or it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was like one of those two feelings. And I think the, the only time, the first time where I genuinely felt hopeful was when we were about 70% of the way through. That was like the first time, just out of the blue, showed up um, on set and we were doing our team debrief and I was just thinking, you know, we, you know, we have five more days left. So we can finally, I, that was the first time actually seeing the finish line. Mm -mm. And I think, um, yeah, from then on we just kind of carried through. Well, um, working on this film, like you said, you had like 40 something actors and a whole bunch of crew members. That's so much to organize, right? So that's probably so stressful. But what would you say is the most fun, rewarding part about directing this project? And what was like the biggest challenge you faced? And how did you overcome that? Yeah, I think the most fun is like looking back. Mm -hmm. on production. It's kind of like mm -hmm. running a marathon. Yeah. If you ask someone in their 20th mile how they're feeling, uh. they're going to tell you to just leave them alone. <laughs> right. Let them, just don't, don't talk to me. <laughs> yeah. But if you ask them how was the marathon last week, they'll say oh, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like that feeling. Mm -hmm. okay. It's only really incredible in hindsight. It's one mm -hmm. of those things. Um, I think the most challenging thing was in the beginning right. because no one, I mean this was everyone's first time making a feature film. Mm -hmm including like 99% of our cast. And you know, we're dealing with a 107, I think, page script that we have to make in two months, mm -hmm. weekends only. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard to get people to truly believe in it and commit to it. And I think the difficult thing personally was I knew that it was not possible. Like I was convinced that it was not possible, mm -hmm. but there was, like Jarvis and I agreed there was a 5% chance. And for me, it, that was enough to at least continue to try because there was no, there was actually no risk in continuing to move forward yeah. um, other than time wasted. So that was our opportunity cost. And so um, it was hard to be optimistic around other people and to tell people that it is, it is very much possible we're going to get this done mm -hmm. while also kind of internally thinking very, very low likelihood. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, it was just a matter of convincing people that it was possible. But once we started to move and gain momentum, I think that's when people, and, and people um, had you know, worked on set for a couple of days, I think that's when all of us started to kind of collectively agree without speaking that uh, this was a serious deal. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I reminded the crew was, um, we are probably one of very few, uh, if not the only group of college students making a full-length feature in the US. 
Oh, wow. And because there are not too many 20, 21 year olds making a feature film over summer. And so just that reminder of like, it is this project has meaning. Um, you know, we're going to do this as a team and we're going to tell the story, not for us, but also because there are people out there who uh, would enjoy the story, would relate to this story. And we, we could impact them and how they think and how they feel. So that was mm -hmm. the, the core incentive for us at the yeah. time. Yeah, once you said like there was Spanish, Korean, and English, I'm like, I want to watch this. <laughs> yeah, Can you tell me how dope. the premiere went? Like, I feel like, I feel proud for you. <laughs> I'm like imagining myself there at the premiere, like I would be like crying. <laughs> Just from listening to all your struggles and all of the hardships that, um, you had to do just to get this thing done. Yeah, mm -hmm. How was the premiere? Like, friends and yeah. family there? You're like, yeah, can you tell me more about that? I, the premiere went really well. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, like, how many, we how were, many about how many attendees, you'd say? It was about 400. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Where? It was at Grand Lake Theater. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. How we, so, how did we miss this? Right. The premiere, <laughs> <laughs> the premiere was, like, like, how did you feel watching your film in that big, big screen? I was very, I was very nervous. I was you very, cried. I did not cry. No, no. I, was, <laughs> I was very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but it was mixed emotions, yeah. and it was hard to fully comprehend what was going on because I was just coming off of editing. Uh -huh. And Jarvis, producer and composer, and I, I mean, right after we wrapped, we were we just locked ourselves in a room for four weeks. Oh. So, I mean, I saw the sun a couple times. Jarvis did, saw no sun. Oh, he, wow. He went outside maybe like three times. <laughs> so he was just sleeping over at my, my place. Um, every morning we'd wake up, just work, sleep at like past midnight. Did that for 28 days. So just me editing, him scoring. And it was, it was nice. It was also a bonding experience, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it was like very unsustainable way oh, wow. of working. So the premiere was like right after the 28th day. So we were editing and you know, we had to create a DCP, which I had never done before. I'm sorry, DCP? What's a DCP? A digital cinema package. Thank, thank you. you. I was like, is that only me? Yeah. We gotta ask the questions okay. that the viewers yeah. want. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we're looking out for One you One more all. time, DCP is? It's a digital cinema package. Digital cinema, got you. Yes. Got Learn something today. Mm -hmm. So the DCP is, you know, obviously it's required by movie theaters because uh -huh. that's the format that they screen the films, digital films in. Oh. So they either get a, a reel of film mm -hmm. that they screen in film, actual film, or if it's a digital file, they have to uh, screen it through a DCP format. Oh, okay. You know, not like an MOV or an MP4. And so I, I didn't even know about this until halfway through the edit. And so we had to figure out how we're going to do these, because normally you send it to a mastering house. Mm -hmm. It's extremely expensive, thousands and thousands of dollars just to create a DCP, but we found a DIY way to do it at home for free. And it took, you know, 15 hours to, ex to transcode oh, wow. the DCP. So we were, being, we were extremely cautious about how we're gonna time the transcoding of the DCP because we still had some tweaks to make. And it's a matter of like how polished do we wanna get um, before we start to risk the premiere. Mm -hmm. So we went, a week early with a unfinished DCP. Um, the projectionist was lovely. She was very nice. She taught us how everything worked and eventually um, we tried to do it. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to come back and you know, redo it. And so it was a lot of going back and forth between the theater uh -huh. in order to get it to work and get it to look like we wanted and get it to look and sound how we wanted it to. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, like the we wanted it to be a theatrical screening. Um, a lot of the folks from the club were like, just do it at, in a classroom or something. But we were like, it's mixed for the theater, mm -hmm. et cetera. So uh, yeah, that's kind of how we got it to the premiere. And eventually what, once we got there, it was just great because I had seen, you know, I saw friends who I hadn't seen since December. I was just busy working on the film. Mm -hmm. It was nice to see them. And I was obviously very, very nervous. I was just kind of sitting in the back, but. Uh, yeah, it was nice. Nice to see everyone. It was bittersweet, honestly, mm -hmm. because it was great that we had you know, accomplished this and we had premiered it. Mm -hmm. But 
at the same time, um, it was bittersweet and it was also predictably bittersweet because mm -hmm. we knew um, that once this was over that um, you know, we'd wake up the next morning and there wouldn't, we wouldn't have that Aww. to think about. So. <laughs> well, looking forward to whatever you have ahead of you um, and your future projects for Thank sure. You. Thank I'm you. Like, I'm, I literally want to watch this now. I did have you. one more question mm -hmm. sure. before we go. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know, how can, I how can I phrase this the right way? How can we or the viewers support your move, your movement? Um, because like you all have been on the grind, you guys are like actually, you know, doing exactly what you, you set out to do. So if you needed anything from a viewer or any of us in this room, how can we support your initiatives, your projects, initiatives? <laughs> um. I mean, any any and all support is welcome. Um, we, we, the club, we're all students. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the club is to inspire the community in, on campus, but also beyond. Um, and, you know, you can come to our, our premieres to see all the hard work that people have put into their short films. And, um, yeah, I think just moral support. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Where can we find more information about you? Where can we follow you? Um, I don't have a website or anything, but uh -huh. you can go and check out the club All right. at capclubberkeley.com. Cap, like C-A-P? C-A-P. 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 Yeah. Cap, okay. Cinematic Arts Production. Okay. Capclubberkeley.com. Um, my... Social media is Alan Wykim. Alan so. Wykim. Yeah, A L A N Y K M. So. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you thank so you. much for joining thank you. us today. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you, likewise. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Have a great night. Don't forget to like. Maybe you comment. No, I can't say this. Before. Like, share, <laughs> comment, subscribe for more of Bay Area local, really talented filmmakers. Bye bye. Bye.